Hello, my little rain clouds. I had some fun uh, doing the coloring and audio recently, and I wanted to do another one. I actually wanted to do this late last night, but I was good and put it off until today. Um, I'm f I I've got a really nice looking sugar skull, uh, like a like a Mexican Dia de los Muertos. Um, skull with like patterns and stuff on it and it's it's really pretty uh it is from the 2016 posh coloring calendar um it's a freely available piece of art from artisfun.com you can color it in with me if you'd like uh or you can color in something else or do whatever else you might want to do <laughs> but i am going to be coloring this in and i wanted to do a little ramble as well I've had a particular set of topics uh, on my mind recently uh, based on what's going on in the media and what's going on in my life and in the life of some close friends and also what I'm studying. And I wanted to talk about grief and loss and maybe a bit about death. And you may be feeling uncomfortable about that. <laughs> you may not really want, want to hear this, so you might be tempted to turn this audio off. And before you do, I'd recommend just reflecting a little on that sense of discomfort. And while you might want to avoid thinking about that topic or hearing about it, because I think a lot of people are very uncomfortable about it, because society tells them to be. Particularly Western society, we have a real taboo around those subjects, and we don't really like talking about them. But it's actually really important that we talk about them and us avoiding those subjects and trying not to think about them actually makes us really fragile when they, when they come up, inevitably they do. And when they come up, we don't really have the ability to deal with them terribly well because it's this like forbidden thing that you just keep out of your mind. And then when it finally does pop up, you are unprepared for it and it just, it catches you off guard and it takes so much out of you. And it also, that, that perspective on it, that attitude of trying to avoid it, of not wanting to think about it, it really reduces our empathy for people who are actually coping with the death of a loved one or their own death or some other form of grief or loss. You know, we, we use euphemisms like oh, they've, they've passed on or they've passed away or gone to a better place or, or whatever, because we don't want to say the D word. We don't want to talk about death and dead. And I think that's, it's really sad um, and unhealthy as well. <laughs> I don't think it's good for us. So I think it's, it's important to try and get a bit more comfortable talking about death because um, it's such a fundamental part of life. And yet one in Western society, we're so, so keen to try and avoid and ignore. Um, people die outside the homes nowadays. They, they tend to die in hospitals a lot more, um, which is one of the reasons why we don't really like hospitals. Um, and also we tend to put a lot of, a lot of elderly people in retirement villages and aged care facilities and things so that we won't have to see the death. Um, we don't have to, to really think about mortality and stuff like that. Um, and that's understandable, but I think it, it weakens us and it, it sort of robs us of a very crucial and important part of life. So I want to talk a bit about death, but I'm not going to just talk about death because there are lots of other things that make up loss and grief. We don't just experience loss and grief through death. There are lots of other things that impact us too. Um, so I want to talk about a wide range of things because I've been studying grief counseling and I want to talk about all sorts of stuff. So this is a nice way of starting that at least. Uh, and speaking of starting, will you want to start this, uh, this coloring in? <laughs> um, what, what colors do I want to use? That's a good question. Let's see. What's that? It's kind of nice. Maybe I'll go for a nice like orange as the as the sort of base background color of this skull while I talk. Um, so, grief and loss. Grief is a is a very natural part of um, 
our response to loss. We experience loss in all sorts of different ways. It's not just death. Any kind of change typically involves some form of loss. Something shifts in its meaning or in the way that it fills our life, or it may just not be there at all. Um, obviously, people can leave our life. We can lose those people through death, but we, we lose people through breakups, we lose people through moving to different cities or changing jobs or, you know, interpersonal conflicts or, or things like that. Um, and also there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we can lose, not just people. Um, we, we are social creatures and people mean a lot to us. And so that is obviously a very significant thing that we do experience loss um, when we lose people. But, um, you know, losing a, losing a job, uh, even if it is a voluntary loss, even if you are changing jobs, even if you leave that job, you are still experiencing a loss because something that was in your life then isn't in your life. And, you know, you can, you can lose pets, you can lose uh, a house, even if you voluntarily move, you know, from, from that house to a different house, you are still losing a home, a place that you've connected with, a place that you have lots of memories, that there's meaning and sentimental value attached to things. Um, moving to a different city or state or country, there's a lot of loss there as well. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's fine for there to be positive things that you gain or nice aspects of a change, but there's still loss as well. And so it's important to, to acknowledge that loss and to be able to grieve for it. Because by grieving, we process that loss and we let ourselves adjust to that loss. Um, there's lots of, lots of different ways of looking at grief and loss. And uh, we can talk a little bit about those different ones. But it's a very diverse and personal thing. Grief and loss look different to everybody different countries, different cultures, they do very different things in the way that they grieve, in the way that they look at death or loss, um, cultural rituals and traditions and um, things that, that different cultures do, they vary so much and it's fascinating. Um, obviously, you know, funerals and stuff too, but, but lots of other things as well. Um, kids moving out of home. Is a, is a big transition, a big change, often a, a seen as a very joyous thing, but obviously loss there too. Um, you know, parents not seeing their, their children anymore, children not seeing their parents anymore, potentially not seeing your siblings. Um, and so that's a big change, and there is a big adjustment there. And it's important to recognize that, because if you just focus on, oh, this is so great, you've got independence, and you can go and live your life, and I'm so proud of you, you kind of, you don't really acknowledge that loss and, and you still feel it, like it's still there and it's going to be impacting you. But trying to ignore it or not really being conscious of it and trying to focus on the other things, it tends to impact us pretty negatively. Um, because, you know, stuff fills a role in our life. We, we have needs all kinds of needs, not just the physical ones, but emotional needs, intellectual needs, social needs, etc. And we have things in our life to meet those needs. And if we don't, then we tend to feel some pretty intense uh, emotions and some pretty intense things that go on to alert us to those needs and try and motivate us to fill those needs. And so typically the things in our life fill a role that is usually to fill some of our needs. And so if we lose something, then there's a good chance that it was meeting a need of ours, possibly multiple needs. And if we don't have that anymore, then our needs aren't being met. And we don't like that because we need those things, obviously. So loss is a very natural thing to experience. It happens all the time and it impacts us. We lose things that were filling our needs, and then the loss alerts us. Our feelings alert us to the loss, I guess. Depends how you want to think of loss, but 
we experience a sense of loss that says, hey, that thing that was filling a need isn't there anymore. The, the need is still there. The, the requirement for that thing to be filled, to be addressed is still there. But the thing that was filling it isn't, which is important. If, you know, let's say your, your mother was driving you to school and then she is unable to do that. Whether she died, whether she's sick, whether the car breaks down, whatever, you still need to get to school. Like, you still have a, a need for someone to take you places and help you do things. So, what do you do in that situation? Obviously, you can't just keep assuming that things are going to work the same way that they've been working. You need to adjust to that loss. And then you need to go, hmm, maybe I need to find another way to get to school. And that might be that, you know, you get yourself to school, <laughs> which could be a very uncomfortable proposition, especially if thus far you have not developed the skills to help you meet that need yourself. If you don't know very well about how to navigate, if you, if you don't feel safe and confident in your ability to get there, if you don't have the physical fitness to walk, if you don't have the ability to drive or ride a bike or get the bus or something, then that's going to be very intimidating and you may not want to do that, which is understandable. So you may think, well, how, how else? Maybe a neighbor can drive me. Maybe a, a school friend can carpool with me. Maybe my dad can take me. Maybe my older sibling can take me. Maybe X, Y, and Z. I need to find a new way of meeting this need. And that might be a permanent thing, or it might be a temporary thing. We may, for a while, have that need met by one person, and then they go, well, okay, I can't, I can't feel this all the time, but I can take you in the interim while you sort of figure it out and get adjusted. Or it could just be like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. I'll just drive you wherever you need to go. <laughs> It's unlikely to happen like that in everyday life, but it's possible. But typically, there is a sense of, oh, this thing I needed, still there, still need it to be filled, but this person or this thing isn't filling it anymore. So I need to adjust to that. And we don't always adjust super well to that. <laughs> Sometimes we're pretty emotional, you know, and that's understandable. There's, there's big feelings involved in grief, particularly the, the bigger the loss, and often the younger we are, the more it impacts us. Someone driving you to school, maybe not that much. Someone meeting your emotional needs for safety and security and support and love and, you know, all that kind of thing. Very big. Having that happen at 40 years old, probably not as big. Having that happen at four years old, very big. You've probably heard of the sort of stages of grief model, DABDA, uh, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. So a lot of people think of that when they think of grief uh, and loss and processing death and things like that. That is uh, called the Kubler-Ross model of, uh, of grief. It was originally designed um, and informed by uh, terminally ill people who were adjusting to the idea that they were going to die. Um, but it was eventually expanded um, pretty, pretty soon after that. I think it was expanded to include like death of all kinds and people uh, experiencing the death of a loved one or, or whatever. Um, but it was pretty clear to Kubler-Ross, after just doing like even a little bit of study, I think, that is not a linear model. Those stages don't go, okay, I'm going to experience all of denial, and then I'm going to go through all of anger, and then anger stops, and then I'm going to go through bargaining. It doesn't work like that. Um, we now think of grief quite differently. I mean, I imagine there are still people who use that Kubler Roth method, but it's Ross method. Um, but it's it's not really like the sort of common way of thinking about grief uh, in uh, at least for psychologists and counselors and stuff. Um, 
it's quite a simple model. It's also quite a Western model. Um, so not everybody experiences grief like that. Um, there are many, many different ways of thinking about grief and loss and, um, different cultures experience it so differently. And it's fascinating to, to look at the way that different cultures, um, experience death, celebrate death, the way that they grieve, the way that they process loss, um, funerary rites and customs and rituals and etc. But uh, there are plenty of different ways of looking at, at that. Um, don't limit yourself to thinking, well, that's just what grief is. That's how we do it. And don't judge yourself for not experiencing things in the, you know, quote unquote, right order or anything. Or if you don't, if you don't notice certain emotions coming up or whatever, don't think, oh, I'm not grieving probably. There's no wrong or right way to grieve. Uh, although I would say that there are coping mechanisms that are not particularly healthy or helpful. Um, like substance abuse, for example, reckless behaviors, self-destructive behaviors, um, quite common, sadly, but not very healthy, not, not particularly helpful. Um, so yeah, like if you experience grief and loss very differently to your family members, uh, for example, totally fine. Even, even among people of the same culture, even among people of the same family, people tend to grieve very differently. Um, often our attachment style uh, tends to inform the way that we grieve. I don't know a whole lot about attachment styles, not enough to make a, an audio about them. Fascinating subject, just don't know a lot about them. Um, but that's certainly something you can look up if you are interested in it. Basically, the the relation, the very early relationships typically that we have with our parents and other people like that, but particularly our parents, uh, influences the way that we think of ourselves and the world and our relationships and indeed the way that we grieve. But there's lots of cultural factors in there. There's, there's all sorts of factors as to how and why we grieve. And it's pretty fascinating, to be honest. Um, Go for kind of a peacock vibe with some of these feathers. Uh, I think they're feathers at well. Maybe they're like leaves or something. Who knows? Um, but yeah, having having a different way of grieving is totally fine and totally healthy. Um, and there's no there's no need to judge uh, how you grieve and worrying that you're doing it wrong or, or anything like that. Uh, just make sure that you're not hurting yourself. But um, Grief involves many, many powerful emotions, conflicting emotions. Um, you, you may experience <laughs> contradictory sorts of things. That's okay. Um, there is a, uh, a way of thinking about grief, particularly like death, uh, grief, bereavement, um, called the continuing bonds model, which is quite nice. And it's sort of it's it's about shifting the way that we think about a loved one um, from a sort of external model where we, we think of them being like a person out in the world doing things and stuff. And instead we, we shift towards an internal representation of them. They are not alive in the traditional sense. They are not out in the world doing stuff, but they are still part of our life and they still live on in us. And we have a little mental representation of them and we can we can talk with them. We can, we can still have a relationship with them, um, because they live on sort of in our head. Um, and you can obviously incorporate spirituality and stuff into that if you want, but you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a spiritual, religious, metaphysically kind of thing. Um, just from a, a sort of very standard scientific, -y, uh, psychological view, obviously we, we have little simulations of people as we, get to know someone, we cultivate a, a little inner representation of them, and we know the kinds of things that they say and the sorts of things that they believe and etc. Um, so that we can kind of run a little simulation of them 
Um, and we use that for all sorts of things. We anticipate what they might like for their birthday. We can anticipate what an argument might be like with them. We can, we can think about the kinds of things that they value, the kind of things that they disapprove of, the, you know, all sorts of stuff. So we, we're already doing that basically. And so the idea is just like, we'll keep, keep doing that. But when they die, you, you sort of have to shift the way that you think of them and the way that you interact with them to a more, um, internal way. And a lot of, like a lot of people have done this for a long time, but there was a sort of pathologizing view, a, a view of this being concerning, um, from a medical standpoint, worrying that people were having hallucinations, worrying that people were schizophrenic or delusional or whatever, that they were, you know, talking to the deceased or, or thinking that they saw the deceased or, or whatever. Um, and now we're like, no, that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's healthy. That's normal. Um, you having conversations with somebody who is not alive anymore is okay. That's, that's just a way that we sort of process death and handle it. Um, it is, it's important to note that there is a distinction between that and like, no, they're generally like alive and I'm, you know, talking to them or whatever, but no, like you, you understand and accept that they are dead and that the way that you interact with them and the, the sort of, um, the notion of their existence, I guess, has changed. You have relocated them, uh, in, in your mind from, alive to kind of dead, but also in, in, in me, they live in me, uh, in a, a sort of Lion King-esque way. And that's healthy. That's fine. That's not something to, um, pathologize, to think that it's crazy or, or worrying or whatever. Um, people have been doing that for thousands of years and it's okay. Um, and as well, um, people have, often reported seeing or thinking that they've seen the deceased, thinking that they've heard their voice calling out or whatever. Um, this is a normal thing that the brain does because we're like, we're trying to process the loss, but we don't really want to believe it. And so we're looking for any sign. We're sort of hyper vigilant for any sign that they might not actually be dead. Um, so we may, perceive sensory input when we perceive sounds like, oh, it kind of sounds like they were calling me from another room or, you know, oh, I, I swear I saw them for an instant on a street corner, but then when I looked, they were gone or whatever. Again, you're not crazy, but it's, it's your brain sort of looking for those symbols, um, for, for things that resemble that person and, and jumping to that conclusion. You see it a lot in PTSD as well when, um, if someone's been abused, they'll, they'll often swear that they saw their abuser on a street corner or something. And they didn't typically, I mean, sometimes obviously they might've, but, um, just, oh, I, I, I'm constantly on the lookout for someone who vaguely resembles the shape and color and whatever. So I thought I saw them, but then my brain was like, oh no, actually I didn't. It's fine. So there's that, that sense of not thinking about people's responses to death and loss and grief as being like, you're crazy. <laughs> we're not, we're not doing that anymore. Um, but yeah, so like there's, there's continuing bonds and a shifting towards a more inner representation. Um, and you do this all the time with people who are still alive. Of course, um, you have likely got an inner representation of me. If, if you've listened to a, a decent amount of my audios and I've played a significant part in your, in your life, you probably have a little inner Rady, um, who, you know, you can, you can listen to and he can tell you the sorts of things that I might say and do the sorts of things that I might do and challenge your, your negative thoughts or give you little words of encouragement or help calm you and comfort you. Um, there are lots of people that you've probably internalized or introjected. You've kind of, um, incorporated an inner representation of them. Uh, and that's perfectly healthy and okay. <laughs> it doesn't make you crazy. We, we do that. And it's, um, it's, it's normal to do that. Um, but that is sort of a way of remembering, uh, and continuing a relationship with someone who, has died 
or, or who is not in our life anymore. I mean, you can certainly still have that with someone who is alive, but not in your life. You've, you've broken up with someone or they've moved away or you've drifted apart or whatever. You can still have that representation, uh, in your mind. But, uh, obviously with death, we need to rely on that more because we have no other way of interacting with that person. We can't reconnect in the physical sense. Um, so that's, yeah, it's, it's important to acknowledge that that is actually an okay thing to do. Um, and so, you know, I, th I think that's quite beautiful in a way that we have these people living on inside of us and that our memories are preserved even once we die. Um, people still have us inside of them. Uh, so even if I were to die tomorrow, a whole bunch of people would still remember me would still have me in their minds telling them like, Hey, it's going to be okay. You can handle this and it's okay to take breaks and Hey, you know, check in with yourself and scan your body. And what, what are you feeling right now? And all those kinds of things, right? Um, it's nice that, that people will have that to, um, sort of continue on that legacy. Uh, and, and obviously, likewise, there are actual <laughs> recordings of me, so people can still listen to me and sort of have an interaction with me. And um, having that that sort of permanence, I guess, is, is quite comforting and nice in a way, too. Um, most people don't have that because they don't tend to record <laughs> themselves that much, but I'm a, a bit of a special case, I suppose, there. Um, so I will live on after death in a sense, as long as YouTube's still around and as long as people still remember me, uh, so that I can still be impacting the world in a way. And my, my thoughts and my beliefs and my attitudes and, and things can sort of be preserved. Um, and that's, that's sort of what most people will try and do as they reach later life, or if they're aware of death coming, um, there will often be a shift towards thinking more about the future and less about the here and now, and they may shift towards uh, a concept of generativity, of uh, wanting to kind of make the world a better place for future generations, for wanting to pass on uh, wisdom and knowledge to, to make a bit of a legacy uh, for themselves, which is a, a natural, healthy thing. Um, there's a philosopher slash psychologist uh, called Erickson who came up with uh, psychosocial stages of development and um, the sort of uh, challenges that we have in each phase of life. Um, and the, the last phase is kind of making peace with the idea of death and mortality and the idea that we will eventually die, but that something we can do uh, to sort of make that more tolerable and uh, feel better about things is to have that sense of generativity to to want to pass things on to the next generation. And, and one way that people do that is to have kids um, so that they are literally like making the next generation. They're passing their, their DNA uh, and potential life lessons and things onto, onto kids. Um, but you can, you know, you can influence the next generation without making the next generation. You can, you can create scholarships. You can write a book. You can, you know, volunteer at a youth center or something. You can do all sorts of things. So you don't have to make a, a kid <laughs> in order to, to pass things on to the next generation. Um, but yeah, that's, that's an important part of life and something that, uh, a lot of people don't really want to think about until quite a bit later, or they may, they may sort of look through gaps in their fingers and not want to look directly at it, but they will still be sort of vaguely aware of, you know, I, I kind of want to make something, a legacy to pass on, but I don't really want to think about death that much. I don't really want to think about mortality. So it's, um, yeah, it's interesting. So some cultures are fine with death. Like they, they celebrate it. They think about it a lot more. It's, it's more of a part of their life. Certainly like in ye olde times, um, death happened a lot more and we couldn't really avoid it. So people were more comfortable with it and we had ways of processing it. There was um, you know, a lot more death in, in art and things like that. 
uh, for a while in the, I think the Victorian times, there were memento moris and, um, people would love to like <laughs> take photos of dead people's faces and stuff, uh, to remember them. People have had grim fascinations with, uh, with death, but yeah. Um, Dia de los Muertos, the day of the dead and, um, you know, lots of cultural traditions and things to, um, to celebrate death, to revere death, to remember the dead, the ancestors that, that have come before them, etc. Um, very, very popular in certain cultures. I am going to make some pink hearts. That's nice. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's certainly a very, uh, a powerful concept and a concept that we kind of have to think about at some point, but we try and put it off in the Western world uh, quite a bit. But um, having having to confront our mortality, we don't really like it. We don't really like the idea that we are going to die one day. And so we try and avoid thinking about it. And then sometimes uh, it's too late. Sometimes death comes as a, as a surprise. Sometimes um, we've just been in denial and then like we, we just kind of get to the end and it's like, Oh, whoops. Um, haven't really prepared myself for that. Haven't really grasped the concept. Haven't made amends. Haven't made, um, my peace with things. Haven't made plans for the next generation or whatever. Uh, so I think it's important to be able to embrace death and to be able to talk about it and think about it and not worry so much. And, we can go through phases and stages where we like, sometimes we might be okay to think about it. And then other times we might be like, Nope, not going to touch that. Not going to, not going to acknowledge that at all. So it varies, but yeah, I think, um, it's important to, to talk about death and little kids. Obviously they can't really grasp the concept of death. Like my nephew will talk about death, but then he'll be like, Hey, when can we see that person who died? <laughs> and he doesn't understand the permanence of it, which is totally understandable and fine that, that he struggles with that. But the kids are naturally curious about death. And so when we act in that kind of taboo, uncomfortable way of like, oh, no, don't, don't, don't ask about that. Don't talk about it. Then we just teach kids like, Hey, death is bad. Don't ever think about death. And, um, we do that with sex as well. Like there's, there's a lot of like weird sexual hangups that people have because it's just not the done thing to talk about it. Um, so I think that we're actually doing more harm than good by trying to shelter people from those kinds of concepts. Uh, when, if you just talk about them and treat them as normal, then people will be like, Oh yeah, okay. That's just like part of life. That's just that thing. Um, and death's really important. Like death is a big motivator for us. It drives a lot of behavior. It, it, it gives us a push to, you know, get stuff done. <laughs> um, if, if everyone were immortal, there would be very little pressure to do anything <laughs> by a certain time. And so probably a lot of stuff would not get done. Um, it would, it would certainly change things, whether it would be positive or negative, who knows? But I think, I think it, death is an important part of life and something that we need to embrace. And, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's good to be able to talk about death and able to embrace it and not be too afraid of it and not protect ourselves from like the discomfort that can come from talking about death because it's really not that bad. <laughs> And I, I don't think that we need to protect ourselves from it. And I don't think that it helps us at all. I think it actually makes things worse for us um, because death is going to happen. And if we don't prepare, if we don't prepare ourselves emotionally and psychologically and philosophically, it's really going to knock us around. Um, but it's understandable that people are uncomfortable with that. We don't like the concept of dying because death is, is an unknown. We don't know what happens when we die because inherently we just can't because it's over, right? Even if you go somewhere else or you do something else or you exist in another form, we can't know about it because it's a change of, of existence. 
So whatever you believe, whatever you think about about death, or about afterlife, about religion, about whatever, it's still an unknown. And so people are inherently pretty uncomfortable with ambiguity, with unknowns, with not knowing. Um, and so we come up with a lot of religious beliefs and spiritual beliefs and you know, we even engineer society and stuff to try and give us protection from from that fear of the unknown. We try and tell ourselves stories, we create stories, we, um, we believe in things that give us comfort and reassurance because it's kind of scary uh, for a lot of people. And whether you believe there's nothing, whether you believe there's something, whether you're not sure, that's okay. But I think we just need to be a bit more comfy with talking about death. Um, so we talked a lot about death, and death's a big part of life, and it's a pretty important kind of loss, but it's not the only kind of loss. Um, so I want to talk about other kinds of loss as well. Loss is pretty diverse, it's pretty significant in a lot of people's lives. Um, obviously there's different kinds of loss, different magnitudes of loss, so you may experience some losses that don't really evoke grief, you don't really need to grieve for those losses because they're not that significant to you, and that's okay. Um, a person may die in your life, and you may not really need to grieve for them, and that's okay. You you may feel guilty about that. Um, sometimes we have people with conflicted relationships or whatever, and it turns out that we're not really grieving in a traditional kind of way, or we're not really feeling that much of a sense of loss. We may even feel a sense of relief or, or something. Um, and there's a, there's a tendency for people to shame and guilt about that, um, or, or to, you know, guilt themselves or whatever. Um, and it's important not to do that, I think, because people handle it differently. And, and just because someone does not appear to be grieving does not mean that they are not grieving. But, um, yeah, so there's, there's lots of different kinds of loss, and not all loss needs to be grieved, but probably, in some sense at least, you will grieve for most loss, and that's okay. Um, right now the coronavirus stuff is happening, and there is a lot of grief. People probably aren't thinking about it in terms of grief, but we have lost a lot of our society, our cultural traditions, the, the kinds of interactions we can have, the aspects of our lives, the, the social interaction, the places, the people, the activities. We've lost a lot of that. And hopefully it's a temporary loss, but it's still a loss and we still need to, to grieve and to adjust to that. It has impacted us, understandably. Um, and we need to grieve for that. And a lot of people probably kind of are grieving for it, but aren't really conscious of it as being a grief response. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of, like, kind of weird, kind of irrational behavior from people. And you may not be thinking about it in terms of, oh, oh, they're grieving. <laughs> like, there's, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of anxiety and uncertainty and people are losing a lot of their lives, of their sense of self, of their community, of their relationships, their their livelihood, their lifestyle, their worldview. Um, it's changing. And there are some good things that are coming from it, but there are a lot of bad things as well. And people are struggling with it. And a lot of people do some pretty irrational stuff when they're processing grief. A lot of people can have some pretty strong reactions um, and can do some pretty mm, self-destructive or impulsive things. Um, if you've listened to my audio on trauma and how we respond to stress and trauma, which I highly recommend you do because it's a really, 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 really good audio, um, you'll know that the stress response impairs our brain's function. And so we don't think about stuff in the same way. Um, having that sense of um, 
future planning, the ability to kind of think things through, to prepare for the long term, to think in the long term, it doesn't really happen so much when we are stressed. So people are probably making a lot of short term, very selfish focused um, decisions, which are unfortunately impacting other people more. Um, but it is just kind of a thing that's happening. And it is a grief response, um, amongst other things, sure. But uh, there's a lot of grief there. And a lot of people not really sure what to do or how, how to handle it and not how to, to come to terms with the loss that they're suffering. Um, in addition to the more obvious forms of loss, there is also anticipatory grief. So we are anticipating future losses. We're, we're thinking, how long is this going to go on? How, you know, am I going to be able to, to go to this wedding that, that was planned? Am I going to be able to see my child graduate? Am I going to be able to do this thing, that thing? We're not just thinking about the now. Obviously, some people are very much focused in doing things in the now. But we are also thinking about the future in terms of, well, what's coming? How much is going to be affected? And that's tough. Even if it doesn't come to pass, even if those things don't happen, we're still grieving for them. Um, if, you know, a, a loved one is missing uh, and they are pronounced dead, uh, they are assumed to be dead, you grieve for them. Even if, you know, a couple of days later they turn up and they're like, oh, no, I'm fine. I just got lost for an extended period of time or whatever. You're still grieving that they may have died and like, oh God, I'm going to be without them. And I, I'm, I'm going to not have this person in my life anymore. That's really scary. I don't know what to do. We are still grieving. Even if the loss doesn't actually happen and it's just imagined, we're still grieving. Um, so there's, there's many, many types of loss and um, there are primary losses. So the, there may be an initial obvious loss, like your, your partner dying, let's say, and then there may be secondary losses that happen later on that are less obvious. So not only did I lose my partner, I lost my best friend. I, I lost um, my emotional confidant. I, I lost the person who takes care of me, who, who does certain things for me. I lost another source of income. So now that my household is affected, um, I'm having to adjust in lots of other ways. I'm, I've, I've lost a lot of other things that I didn't realize I necessarily had lost because I was just processing this big, obvious one. We also experience um, tangible losses. So there can be obvious physical things like, hey, that person is no longer there. Um, or, you know, I, I, I lost my job and so I don't have a place to go and I don't have a source of income anymore. I don't have those, those physical, tangible things. But we may also have intangible losses things that you can't see. So I may have lost my sense of status and self-worth, self-identity. I may have had a lot of um, social clout that, that I had from that job, influence. I, um, I had a sense of pride and fulfillment that aren't there anymore. Those kinds of losses can impact us and they're just as, as important, if not more important than the, than the tangible ones, the physical ones. Um, I lost my house is obviously a big one, but there was a lot of sentimental value to, to that house. There are a lot of memories that I had with that house. It's not just that I don't have a place to live or that all my stuff is gone, but there were so many memories around that too. Um, we may have lost, you know, connection to culture, to, to our heritage. There are things that, that can't be replaced that I lost in that house fire or, or whatever. Um, or, or indeed like my entire country got invaded. And in addition to not being safe and not having a place to live, my culture has been disrupted or damaged. Um, there are all sorts of losses that we can experience and people are often not as aware of those other kinds of losses, the intangible ones, the secondary ones, people may show up you know, when someone's died or whatever, they'll come over and they'll give you a casserole and they'll try and take care of you in, in the immediate, but they don't necessarily think of like, 
you know, months down the line, oh, that actually, yeah, okay, that, that big thing impacted them. They don't have this anymore. They don't have that. Um, so those kinds of things can be really important um, to try and be mindful of that, you know, this, this loss is about more than just they don't have a partner, they don't have a house, but they've lost other things too. And those, those things may not become apparent until much later. Even if you are the one that suffered the loss, you, you may not be aware of those things until they, until they come up. Um, you know, holidays and anniversaries and stuff uh, can, can just sort of remind you, oh, wow, all of those things that I used to have or used to do or used to rely on, all of those needs that used to be filled, I don't have any more. Um, so there can be like big, big, big impacts and things that are not uh, quite so obvious. So yeah, there are, there are lots of forms of losses. Um, and it's, it's difficult to adjust to them. You know, we, we have a tough time with loss and we're meant to, we're, it, it's meant to be a struggle. It's meant to impact us. It's meant to bring up a lot of feelings and we're meant to feel sad because sadness is letting us know this thing was important to me. This thing was, a, was an important thing. It meant a lot to me. Um, it was a, it was a fundamental part of my life. It was, it was something that I valued. I had needs tied around this. It was you know related to my sense of self-esteem or self-worth or, or whatever it is. We're meant to feel sad. Um, loss and, and grief are, are sort of the, the flip side to the same coin as love and connection. You know, we invest ourselves in relationships. We invest ourselves in, in loving things, in valuing things, whether it's a, a, a relationship with a person or a pet or, you know, a, a television show that we loved or, or a job or, or whatever it is. And so losing those things impacts us. And, and we do feel a sense of loss. We, we feel that sense of, of, uh, emptiness because a thing that was part of our life is now gone. So having that sadness is important and healthy. We don't like it, <laughs> which is okay, but it's important. And I think that, again, we, we place this taboo and this stigma around loss and we don't really want to address it or acknowledge it so much. And it's sad um, because then when we do experience loss, we, we don't feel able to talk about it or open up about it. We don't, we don't get the support that we need. Um, and so many people feel isolated and they, they, they don't know how to handle their feelings. They don't know how to handle things, especially the, the less sort of acceptable, the less palatable sorts of feelings like anger, for example. Anger is a is a, a natural, understandable part of loss. Not everyone's going to experience anger with their loss, but a lot of people do, and that's okay. But again, we may not we we may not be allowed to express that to people. We may not feel comfortable doing that, um, and it's it's tough. It's tough to to not be able to express and share those kinds of feelings because we want to. We are social creatures and being able to share grief and to grieve with someone is very, very helpful a lot of the time. Not everyone wants to, but I, I would say that a lot of people really benefit from having other people to grieve with. Um, and so, you know, we, we tend to have wakes and funerals and, and uh, various rituals and gatherings and, and things so that we can grieve together so that we can remember a person together, so that we can process a loss together. People may hold, you know, candlelight vigils and things. People will have, um, you know, cancellation parties for their, for their favorite shows or whatever, or they'll, um, they'll make a, a big, um, attempt at, at going to a, a final concert before a band breaks up or whatever it is, because they want to be with other people who understand that loss and share that loss with them. And, it's validating to have people go like, yeah, you're right to feel sad. <laughs> like I, I, they meant a lot to me too. And I'm really sad about that or I'm feeling angry or, or whatever. So it's, it's important and healthy to share our grief. Um, 
but some people grieve differently and that's okay. Um, some people want to stay strong for others. They want to be the helper. Um, that can be a way for them to handle grief, possibly a way for them to not have to handle grief, not really acknowledge or accept it. Um, but some people want to stay strong or feel that they need to stay strong, quote unquote, um, which often means don't show emotion. <laughs> and um, that's not helpful, typically. Uh, a lot of a lot of people will try and put on a brave face for kids, um, which is actually just telling them, hey, you're not allowed to grieve, or, or like, it's not okay to be sad about this, or, or whatever. Um, so it's actually really important that we show kids like, no, it's, it's healthy and okay to, to be sad about this, to, um, to express these kinds of feelings and, you know, to, to, to have, uh, anger and sadness and, and whatever else. Um, the, the Kubler-Ross method with the, with the, you know, the denial and the anger and the sadness and, and blah, blah, blah. It, it's not, you know, it's not the way to think of grief. You can still use it, and certainly it can be informed by those kinds of things. Um, but having having the diversity of emotions represented like that can be helpful for people so that they can see, oh yeah, it's okay for me to feel lots of different things, possibly at the same time. Um, I'm not bad for doing that, and I don't have to just be sad because we we experience loss in lots of different ways across lots of different fields of life. You know, even the same loss impacts us in many different ways. So having that difference um, of emotion is totally healthy and totally okay. Denial is is really helpful because it helps us to parcel out the loss and the pain and and. Um, the hurt that we experience with that, it, it helps us to um, portion it out over a more tolerable um, space of time so that it's not this intense gut punch of feeling and instead we handle a little bit of it and we can kind of put it aside for a while and we can function and, and do the kinds of things that we need to do um, without being completely shut down and, and crippled by it. So denial is very healthy. It's, it's a helpful thing in moderation. There are some people who go way, 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 way overboard with denial and they don't want to acknowledge that something is happening at all. Um, it, you know, people who, who get a, a cancer diagnosis and they, they just refuse to even think about it. Like, no, of course I'll get better. It's fine. Um, and so eventually they die and they leave like their family with, no preparations for the funeral, for medical procedures, for, you know, having their affairs in order, getting their estate together. So people are just completely unprepared. And then the death bowls them over. It cripples them, um, which is very unfortunate. People often really don't want to deal with death and don't want to acknowledge its possibility and they will just try and put on a happy face and not think about it and not acknowledge that it's possible or even inevitable. Um, and that's tough. That, that, that rarely makes things better. So denial is helpful in moderation, but it is not something that you just do <laughs> and nothing else. Um, anger is... Anger is typically us trying to grapple with meaning to kind of process why and how the loss happened and to grapple with the idea that life isn't fair um, because it's not. And we don't like that, <laughs> understandably. So when we try to process that loss... We think about why and how it happened, how it could have happened, who's responsible, what kind of factors led to the death happening, or, or whatever the loss is. Um, but typically, you know, we think about death a lot. Um, personally, I, I, I don't really like the focus on death when it comes to loss, but death is often one of the most significant forms of loss. Um, so when when we're trying to come to terms with it, you know, 
there will often be a lot of self-blame. Well, I could have done this, I should have done that, I could have done more, this is my fault, blah, blah, blah. Um, we may also blame other people for it, including the deceased, uh, or, or whatever it is that was lost, but, um, you know, the, 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 the stupid person, why didn't they do this? It's so unfair that they're leaving me with all this burden and, and pain, and oh, I wish that they'd done this differently. Um, we may have anger towards the universe, or God, or fate, or karma, or whatever it is that you believe in. Um, even if you don't believe in something, you may sort of temporarily direct your anger to that concept. Um, it, it may just sort of be life and existence in general, the, the fact that it is not fair. Um, that is a pretty tricky thing to experience. A lot of people are not particularly well ha well equipped to handle anger. They, they don't really know what to do with anger, and anger is not typically a very socially acceptable thing. Uh, for men, it's more acceptable. Uh, sadly, it's one of the few emotions that kind of is acceptable for men to express, but yeah, there's um, certainly, you know, sides of grief that people consider to be ugly and anger is healthy and and natural to to experience like that but it's tough to handle it um people don't really know what to do with that anger um it may manifest in self-destructive behaviors it may manifest in coldness lashing out at people um often people who don't really understand and who are offering you like empty platitudes and telling you oh it'll get better you'll be fine they're going to a better place and blah 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 it was their time to go it's all part of god's plan etc um you can see a lot of rage and uh people just kind of exploding and things like that which is understandable because you're trying to come to terms with things and process things and then being told these sort of overly simplistic, comforting notions, um, it, it really helps. <laughs> for some people it might, but I, I would say for a lot of people it doesn't help. Um, and it's typically more for the sake of the comforter because people don't know what to do when someone has died or someone's processing loss and grief. They're like... Ooh, this is big. I haven't been trained on what to do with this. I don't know what to do. I'm uncomfortable with this because I'm not meant to talk about death and I don't like people expressing emotion because our society frowns on that. I don't like people crying, you know? Um, that, that's, a, that's a big thing in um, particularly Western society, I guess, but we don't really like people crying. Uh, so a lot of people are very uncomfortable with displays of emotion, particularly crying. And so when someone cries around them, they want to stop that. <laughs> they don't care for that at all. They want to stop it, so they'd say, Hey, don't cry. It's okay. <laughs> stop crying. It's all right. You know? And it's it's not, Oh, do you need to cry? Okay, cry as much as you need. Okay, yeah, sure. That's a healthy response. It's, please stop crying. You're making me uncomfortable. So they will, they will again, offer those kinds of platitudes, those kinds of automatic responses of, please stop this now. <laughs> I don't know how to deal with this. I'm uncomfortable. Um, so yeah, like not being comfortable with death and grief, wanting to try and fix it, wanting to, to do something to make that stop is not helpful and uh, will often make someone feel quite angry at you because they're already like trying to grapple with, with anger potentially. Uh, and then you're sort of simplifying things. You're, you're trying to brush them off, you're trying to stop them from doing what they need to do, uh, which is grieving and e experiencing emotions and expressing them and doing things with them. Um, tends not to really help much. Uh, so they may not appreciate that at all. So I would recommend getting comfortable with death. <laughs> if possible, getting comfortable with sadness and loss and anger and people crying, because uh, it's really not so bad. I'm I'm very comfortable with people crying now. I, I routinely uh, handle people crying with me, around me, towards me, whatever. Um, it's important to get comfortable with that, and you do it by exposing yourself to it. You do it by getting 
used to it by experiencing it and going, oh, okay, this isn't actually that bad. I've been told that it's bad. I've been told that I'm not meant to be experiencing, you know, an emotional outburst or whatever, that, that I should try and stop that. But actually it's fine. Um, and recognizing that that's healthy for them to do, that, that crying is a good thing uh, and grieving is a good thing. It's, it's important that, that we do that. And it's important that we as helpers and carers and friends and support networks and whatever, that we let people do that. Um, crying is a healthy thing. Uh, there are different kinds of crying, but typically crying is very good for us. And we have the ability to cry for a reason. Uh, so it's, it's good to do that. It's good to let people cry and to encourage them to cry with us and to learn that it's okay to be around tears, to be around emotion, and that you don't have to do anything about it. The bus pretty much drives itself, right? Like, they don't need you to stop them crying or grieving or being sad or whatever. You just be accepting and give them space and let them do it and be like, yep, yeah, it's okay. You're safe to do that with me. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of you. If you ask me to do something, I will do it. But I could just like sit here with you and let you cry. And then, you know, when you're, when you're done, I'll give you a glass of water or whatever. I'll take care of you. Cause that's important. Just showing that you're accepting them, that you're not judging them, that you're not shutting them down, that you're not trying to stop them doing what they naturally do, what they need to do. Grief is, it's an intense process. It's a process that can go on for a long time. It can take many forms. Um, it's, it's something that the, the loss never goes away. We will always experience that loss, but it changes in how we experience that loss. And it does typically get a lot less intense. It, it, it is easier to handle, um, over time and as we process the loss, as we come to terms with it, as we adjust to it, as we find new ways to meet those needs, we become more able to handle that loss. And we learn to incorporate that loss into our lives um, without it completely dominating our life, without it obscuring everything and eclipsing everything. Um, but in, in the short term, certainly, we need to experience that kind of emotional intensity. We need to experience and process those emotions because those, those emotions are helping us come to terms with this is what life is like now. This is, this is how life is going to be. This is, this is, you know, what this loss means for us. So coming to terms with that is important. And it's, it's, it's really vital that we are able to embrace that process. And obviously it's, it's an intense process that can be overwhelming and scary and we don't really like it that much. And we're not meant to like it and that's okay. But just having the, the space to be able to process those emotions and to be able to make sense of loss and to adjust to that loss, to adjust to a life without that thing or that person where our needs are going to have to be filled by something or someone else we need to be able to take some time to grapple with that. And we need space to do that. And by space, I don't mean people leaving you alone. I mean, people giving you the opportunity to do that and for them to be there comforting or holding or accepting or helping you to do that. Comforting doesn't mean stop feeling what you're feeling, it means I'm going to help you with it. I'm going to help you cope with these feelings and, and come to terms with them and make sense of them. And I think that's a distinction that a lot of people don't understand. When they think of how to comfort people, they think I got to stop them crying. <laughs> I got to stop them being sad. I got to, I got to make really great jokes to cheer them up or something. And that's not the case. Um, so having, having that, that shift, uh, that conceptual shift is really important. Being able to 
think about loss and death and grief and not shy away from it and not think, oh, it's so uncomfortable or it's so intimidating or I don't know what to do. I don't know how to fix it. You don't meant to fix it. People, I think, have a very sort of innate capacity to to grow and process and heal and give themselves the things that they need if they are allowed to do so. And it's important that you just try to give them that space and that opportunity to do what they need to do. They don't, they don't necessarily know what it is that they need, but they will find it. They will, they will somehow instinctively, subconsciously gravitate towards what they need. Um, which is, I think, a lot of how people find my channel and, um, access these kinds of things is they don't know exactly what they're looking for, but they just kind of poke around in the dark in the general direction of it. And then they sort of stumble upon it and go, oh, okay, that's what I needed. And the same is true of you supporting them. Like they'll help you with it and they'll find their own way with it. As long as you're just kind of there being with them, being beside them, holding their hand and patting their back and saying like, yeah, we'll get through it together. Grief is... It's, it's, it's a tricky concept, certainly, and a lot of people are very intimidated by it, but it's really not that bad. <laughs> it can, it can be a surprisingly lovely thing. It can be, uh, an experience that actually brings people closer together, that brings joy and laughter and pleasure and fun and, it, it can be a surprisingly positive, enjoyable experience. Obviously, there are ups and downs with it, but you, you might be surprised at how much people actually laugh um, and smile <laughs> when they are grieving. Uh, if if they have the people to kind of help them do that and, and to give them that space. And particularly, I think, um, r recalling the deceased or, or, you know, whatever it was that was lost, but we'll, we'll probably talk about deceased recalling that person and how they interacted with them and the, the funny things that they did and the, the memories that they had, all those kinds of things. They're often funny and, and wholesome and nice, um, experiences. They're often quite heartwarming and it's, it's important that we don't lose sight of that. Like, yes, there will be sad things, there will be uncomfortable things, there will be anger and bitterness and whatever else, but there's also a lot of joy and a lot of laughter. Um, so I think people, people tend to shy away from it and be scared because they're told to be scared. And grief is often sort of represented in a very negative way, I think. But actually, there's, there's nice things too. Um, and it's, it's healthy, it's important, it's natural, it's, it's something that we do, and it's something that we should be allowed to do and encouraged to do. Grief doesn't end necessarily. I mean, it, it sort of can end, but um, often we will revisit loss and grief, and we may experience grief in a kind of cyclical sense. There may be sort of a cycle where we may be focused on remembering and then we may be focused on moving forward and then we may sort of loop back to a kind of remembrance cycle and then, you know, again, go to a, a different sort of moving forward or something. And that's okay. Um, I think a lot of people are worried about relapse and backsliding and losing progress or being set back or something when that's not the case. Like we, we, we will get sad about that loss again. We will remember that person or that thing, we will miss that and we will want to recall them or dwell on them. We, we will want to um, share that and the loss never goes away. The thing that we lost never goes away either. We won't, we won't forget. That's, that's such an important thing, right? It's, people, People often will phrase it as moving on, and sometimes that has connotations of forgetting it, getting over it. Um, and we don't. We don't forget. And we shouldn't forget, because that was important to us. But 
we come to terms with the fact that it is not going to be the same as it was. That life is going to be different, that our relationship with whatever it was that we lost is going to be different. And that it's okay to be in a state where you are remembering that, where you are missing that, where you are wanting to be with the thing that you lost. It's okay to dwell on it, to remember, to to want to share with others. There are forms of complicated grief where we may have sort of a, an unhealthy fixation with it. We may not be able to, to move on. We may not be able to fully um, process the loss. And that can be a problem, um, but it's rare. And, and I think really most people are okay to to come to terms with it. It may take a while, it may be messy, there may be ups and downs, but they will eventually get to a point where they can live with that loss and process it and come to terms with it. And it's something that you can view in a lot of different ways. There are tasks of mourning and grieving, there are continuing bonds, there are dual process models, there are all sorts of different ways of looking at grief, but the general sort of idea is that we need to acknowledge the loss and to come to terms with it, of what that means for us, that life is going to be different. We need to feel the pain of grief. We need to be able to be present and to feel that and to acknowledge, hey, this was significant to me. This actually meant a lot to me and I'm, I'm hurting because I don't have this thing anymore. And that pain is alerting me to the fact that I don't have this anymore and that I need something to fill that void. And as an aside, filling the void is something that we really, really want to do typically. So when we break up, we may very, very quickly want to go on a rebound relationship um, whether it's casual sex or, or a friendship or, you know, a romantic relationship, dating with someone, who knows. But we want to fill that void very, very quickly. Um, we may throw ourselves into a job or a hobby or other relationships or whatever it is. And we try and fill that hole, that void, that emptiness, because it hurts to feel that. And it's a kind of reactionary measure a lot of the times of I was deriving meaning or fulfillment or purpose or joy or whatever from this thing that I've lost, and I still need that, so I'm going to get it from somewhere else. It's understandable that we do that, and, and there's nothing inherently bad about that, but it can be unhealthy if we don't actually stop and acknowledge the loss. If we, if we just kind of pretend that things are fine, that it didn't actually impact us, or that it didn't happen, that can be a problem. So it's, it's important that we still give ourselves time to acknowledge, hey, that, that thing actually impacted me. That, that thing did happen. It's real. Um, and I am hurting. And we, we're meant to hurt. We're meant to feel the pain of loss, unpleasant as it is. And it's meant to be unpleasant because it's meant to alert us to this thing was in your life and now it's not, or it's different than what it was. These needs were being filled. They're not being filled. We need to take a look at what they are and how to fill them rather than just desperately grabbing at something that may not actually fit in that hole. And... We don't like that. <laughs> we don't want to spend any time feeling empty. We don't want to spend any time feeling that kind of pain. So we go, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll just throw myself into my work, or I'll drink my problems away, or I'll just have rebound sex after a breakup, or whatever. And that doesn't tend to work super well for us. It can be a form of coping, typically not a healthy form of coping, but... In moderation, it can be okay, but we do need to process the loss and we need to feel the pain and we need to come to terms with it and we need to construct meaning around it. We need to understand what this actually means for us and our life and our world 
And that's tough. And that's an ongoing process. It's a, it's a process that takes a long time uh, or can, can take a long time. But eventually we will, hopefully, uh, come to terms with it and process it and get to a point where we can kind of make peace with it. We've, we've accepted the loss. We've incorporated the loss into our worldview. We understand the loss. We understand what the need is and how we can better fill those needs and that space in our life. And so eventually we will relocate the deceased or the, the lost thing so that we will stop thinking about it in terms of this person is alive and I'm going to see them or this show is still around or this band is still around or whatever it is. We will relocate the thing that we have lost in our mind and we will, we will think of it as a thing in the past or a thing that is now different or whatever, we will think of it in a different way and we'll be able to kind of go on with life. We'll be able to reinvest in life. We won't be so petrified of the idea of loss and losing more things. Because when people lose something, they can tend to sort of circle the wagons and try and prevent more loss and more pain. They can get very concerned or clingy about things. They can get very nervous and worried and protective. Um, or they may distance themselves. They may try and insulate themselves from, from further loss, um, which doesn't tend to help, but is an understandable reaction. Eventually, at least, we need to be able to reinvest in relationships, in life, in activities, in things, and not be so conscious and afraid of loss um, to, to see that it's okay. Like it's, it's something that we can handle. It's a part of life. It's not, it's not fun, but it's okay. And we need to make peace with that. And it, it, it can be a struggle. Certainly it can, it can be a tough thing, but hopefully at least we come to terms with that we get to a, a, a sort of healthier view of the world and we feel more secure about how we live and our relationships with those things and our ability to cope and process and handle loss and, and grief um, and that's really vital really really crucial um, that, that we are able to continue living. Um, and, and I think a lot of people want to skip to that <laughs> as well. Uh, particularly if you are comforting someone who is grieving, you may want them to, to skip to that or, or someone who is comforting you. And so it's like, oh, you've got to, you've got to keep going. You've got to move on. You've got to, you know, you've got to keep living. And so we may try and rush people to that stage and they're not necessarily ready yet. Um, and, and again, as with any kind of stage or phase or task related things, it's not linear. It's not you do one and then you do two and then you do three and you do all of those before you start the next one. Often we're doing stuff simultaneously, right? So the processing and the feeling and the acknowledging and the you know, reinvesting and relocating, it's, it's all, you know, typically happening at the same time, maybe at different rates, maybe in different ways, but we're still coming to terms with loss and, and um, processing it and handling it and coping with it and gradually adjusting the way that we see the world. And that's, that's all, you know, it's, it's good. It's, it's, it's healthy to be doing that stuff. And most people will do that unassisted. Well, not, not unassisted, but they'll be able to do it without professional intervention or help. Um, it, it will be messy, it will be hard, but they'll usually be able to handle it. But some people do need help um, with grief and, and with loss, particularly if the loss is big, particularly if it happens early on, particularly if there are unresolved issues uh, often related to earlier loss. Um, it may be something that they, they do need help with, and that's okay. And if that describes you or someone that you know, I, I would strongly advise trying to get some help um, because it really can be very, very helpful to, to have that. Um, it, it is something that is quite taboo and there's quite a lot of stigma around receiving professional help. Um, but I think 
it's something that's becoming more accepted and something that is more widely done. And it's important um, because grief can be crippling if we don't deal with it. If we, if we are not acknowledging loss and not really trying to fill those needs or we're filling them in very inappropriate, ineffective, self-destructive kind of ways, that's, that's not helpful uh, at all. And so we need to, to be able to do something about that. We need to be able to, to, to get the help that we need so that we can continue to live life so that we aren't, you know, worried about further loss, um, to such a, a debilitating degree. Obviously it's still something to worry about, but it's, it's not something that will, um, that will preclude us from reinvesting in life, from living. Uh, so it's, it's really vital that we are able to, to process that and to work through that. And if we, if we need to, to talk to a therapist or a counselor or something that we do that, um, everybody's different in how they process grief and loss. And so every counselor is going to help people in different ways. Um, and the same counselor will help lots of different people in different ways, depending on what the, the people need, depending on how they feel, depending on how they view loss or death or, or change or how they view themselves, how they view life, um, the kind of cultures that influence them, all those sorts of things. Uh, it is, it is a very diverse kind of, um, aspect of, of life and of culture. And it's, it's really cool to, to see all of the different ways, like to see the, the Tibetan book of the dead, um, to, and how they like read for 40 days to the, the spirit of someone who has recently died and, um, kind of guide and prepare them for the afterlife. The, the, the way that the ancient Egyptians used to, um, mummify people and, and embalm them and take all their organs out and prepare them for their own journey and being weighed and, and, uh, judged, uh, in the afterlife, the, you know, the old, um, putting, coins on on people's eyes when they died uh, to to pay the the boatman the ferryman Charon uh, to to take them down the river Styx into the the afterlife the um all the different rituals and customs that different cultures and and places and times had uh is fascinating the um uh, greek greek widows tend to wear black like all the time uh and and that's um often seen as like a really nice thing for them to do. They, they enjoy it uh, in a sense. It's a nice way to kind of show respect and reverence for the dead and um, kind of embrace their, uh, their different role now. Uh, although conversely, some Asian cultures uh, wear white when mourning. And um, the, the way that uh, like Aboriginal Australians, Indigenous Australians will give the deceased a different name. Sometimes they will, they will, um, refer to them differently that their, their funerals tend to be very long, very intense. Um, there's, there's wailing and music and, and, um, all sorts of things that, that happen days long funerals sometimes. And, um, Lebanese funerals often have a lot of wailing, a lot of crying as well. Uh, I, th I think it's China possibly that will, uh, hire people <laughs> sometimes to wail for you to, um, to properly mourn uh, the death of someone. There's lots of really, really fantastic, uh, fascinating cultural differences in how people look at, at death and loss. And they will even differ between cultures. They will differ in, in uh, just like so much between different families, different people in families, different ages and generations and stuff. Um, it's really fascinating. Yeah. And speaking of different generations, um, there's a lot of grieving going on for climate change as well. There's a, there's a, there is a profound sense of loss, um, and there is that sort of accompanying grief that, that we're coming to terms with a very big change in how we view the world. Um, that is a profound thing. And, and of course, many people don't want to acknowledge it. There is, there is a lot of denial, um, which is very unfortunate. 
and and has contributed more to the problem. But um, there is a lot of anxiety. There is a lot of anger, definitely. Um, there is a lot of of sadness. There's there's a sense of depression and impotence of powerlessness for some. Um, there is. For, for some, I suppose, some acceptance as well, some resignation to the fact. But, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the same as a, a, a sort of individual personal loss, definitely, but there is still a, a profound sense of grief. Um, and, and for, for some people, it, they don't notice that it's grief. They don't acknowledge that or understand that it's grief. But there is obviously a, a great deal of um, of suffering and, and of powerful emotions and a lot of stuff going on for people, and they just don't really know why. They, they, they don't really conceive of it. They can't really process this giant thing that's happening in the culture, um, in, the, in the world culture, indeed. And, and um, you know, I think... Uh, for the older generations who may not really have to deal with it so much, who may not really be around to sort of see it, they don't really want to think about it. Whereas for the people who will have to deal with it, they very much do want to think about it. And um, that difference uh, is is very tough as well. So there's, I, I think, quite a lot of resentment and animosity there. Um, and it's interesting to see different people's approaches to handling that and processing that and trying to do something about it. Um, and it's important to note that just because we need to acknowledge a loss and to uh, accept it and kind of process it doesn't mean that we can't try and still make things better. Like it's, it's important for us to try and do um, what we can to stop climate change and to uh, make it better if we can or to to uh, reduce the impacts of it and to help people um, come to terms with with uh, the nature of things but yeah like just because um, there is a sense of loss that we need to accept and process doesn't mean that we should just roll over and die um, but rather come to terms with with what this really means to to us individually, what this means as a society, what kind of things we may need to uh, put to bed, the, the kinds of behaviors and traditions and processes and ways of living that used to be things that people did and now aren't really ethical or viable. Um, it's, it's tough for people to come to terms with the fact that life needs to change. Um, and so there is a lot of denial and uh, I would say sort of undiagnosed or undetected grief where, where people don't really want to come to terms with the idea that life and traditions and the world need to change. Um, that our approach to money and the environment and all those sorts of things need to change. And uh, yeah, like understandably people don't like that. <laughs> They, they, they don't like change typically, uh, or, or at the very least, they don't like loss. Um, good things can come with change, but those are kinds of losses, right? The idea that I'm, I'm not going to be able to live the way that some of my ancestors used to. I'm not going to be able to have the, the sort of quintessential American dream or that this, this industry isn't going to work the way that it used to. Those are kinds of losses, um, and they will be felt on a personal level and on a cultural level, on a societal level. They are things that individuals will be impacted by and, you know, entire industries, entire nations, entire groups of people will, will have to process and uh, come to terms with the fact that, yeah, stuff's going to be different. <laughs> and we don't like that. But it's important that we do. Um, and we're seeing a lot of emotionally charged responses, a lot of very polarizing um, stances and opinions and demonstrations and, and things like that. And we're, and we're seeing that for lots of other things too, not just climate change. But I would say that climate change is a very sort of well, universal 
thing. It's a, it's a global issue, you know. But we're seeing a lot of like political and social and, and cultural uh, things like that too, of, of people having to uh, come to terms with changes and losses. And um, it's it's tough for, for, for people, and especially if they are unaccustomed to thinking about loss other than death, because they're like, well, it's not loss because nobody died. Um, but that's not all that loss is. And, and so it's important that we are able to, um, to see it as loss because we lose things that are significant to us. And if we aren't able to accept and process them in healthy ways, that can very much stop us from living life and from being able to be well-rounded, healthy people. You know, if we're, if we're refusing to come to terms with something, um, because we don't understand it or whatever, that, that is, uh, are going to be a problem for us. So having that sense of, of loss, uh, is important, I think. Um, and uh, I, I think a lot of people don't really think of loss in that, in that sense, but it is, uh, and, and involves loss certainly. And yeah, like, you know, um, people having their favorite TV show canceled, uh, is, is a big loss. Uh, it, it does not have to be a person, um, graduating is a loss. Obviously you gain things and it can be happy and joyous, but you, 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 you lose stuff too. You lose connections, you lose a routine, you lose a sense of identity, you lose a, a, a community, you, you, you lose lo lots of things. Um, we can, we can lose a sense of security. We can lose a sense of trust in something, in an institution, in an industry, in a person, in a group, in the universe, in whatever, uh, lose a sense of innocence. We can, um, we can lose faith in ourselves. We can, um, lose just all sorts of things, really. Um, <laughs> we, we, we can lose hope. We can, we can lose money. We can lose uh, a house. We can lose our culture. We can um, lose our history. We can lose a sense of identity, all sorts of things, you know, thinking about like um, slavery, there are so many losses involved in something like that or, or in the Holocaust or, or, you know, those sorts of, of massive, um, cultural things that aren't necessarily acknowledged or thought about as loss. Um, and, and often these sorts of transpersonal losses, if you like, these things that are so much bigger than individuals, um, losses that entire cultures or groups experience. Um, and those kinds of things are really significant, but sometimes not really addressed. Um, there, there are very sort of traumatic things that can happen to entire cultures and groups, um, as well as the individuals that make up those groups. And those kinds of traumas are actually passed down to future generations, even, even though they may not be aware of them those kinds of losses are passed down still, uh, intergenerational trauma. It's a very, it's a very tricky, powerful thing that people are often not really aware of, but things that are unspoken, um, sadnesses, hurt, um, prejudices, historical things, you know, stuff that we don't talk about anymore or things that, um, that we try and keep from people, stuff that is seen as too painful, or too powerful to talk about, stuff that you're not yet old enough to understand. People get a sense that that is a thing, even if it's not discussed or talked about, even if it's not something that they're privy to knowing about, they kind of feel the absence of that. Um, and, and indeed, there are physiological and genetic components to that too. So, um, stresses that impact people change their DNA. Um, what, what is, what is termed epigenetics, which is, uh, sort of the hormonal and chemical aspects, uh, of 
changes that happen to someone's DNA. So you, you, you have genes that will uh, make certain little cellular machines, let's say, um, and those can be switched on or off or, or sort of turned up or turned down um, by the environment, by, by the stresses that you face, by the stuff going on in your body. Um, the stresses will impact your, um, your genes and, uh, you will pass them down <laughs> to your children if you decide to have children. Um, but also if you have a child growing inside of you or something, uh, stress can be passed on that way too. So yeah, um, that can certainly be a thing. And, and yeah, like even, a. uh, a miscarriage or, or something um, can affect children, even if it's never talked about. They will, they will get a sense of something was wrong, something wasn't talked about, something happened, but I, I just don't know what it was. Um, and so lacking the language and the knowledge of what it is that's affecting you can be pretty, pretty unpleasant as well. Um, so it's, I think it's, it's important to, to talk to kids about stuff that, that happens. Um, we worry about scarring them, but I think ironically we, we end up scarring them regardless. Um, but perhaps in, in worse ways, in, in ways that, um, that impact them in invisible ways, uh, and that they may not really ever come to terms with or be aware of, but they still feel the effects. Uh, of so uh, yeah it's um it's obviously a, a really tricky subject and a very complex subject but i think that talking to to kids about these things is okay and that it's okay to be sad as a kid <laughs> like we don't we, we shouldn't try to to be happy all of the time we we have sadness for a reason we have anger for a reason we have all of these feelings and um it's, it's important to be whole. It's important to be connected with our emotions, with our experiences, with, um, with the sort of supposed good and bad aspects of, of life. Um, the positive and negative emotions, if you want to call them that. Although I don't, I don't really think that it's helpful to, um, to think of emotions as positive or negative. Um, because the, you know, the negative ones, unpleasant as they might be, are still helpful. Um, they, they, they almost certainly perform a, a function, um, and help us in some way. You know, sometimes they can be misguided or misaligned or ill-informed, but typically speaking, the, the, the emotions that we have serve a function, even if we don't like them. Uh, and often us not liking them is part of the function. So I think, um, I think that's, yeah, it's, it's important to, to be more open and honest about, about stuff with, with kids. Um, kids are pretty, pretty switched on and they will get a sense of things. Even if you don't talk about it, even if you try and hide it, they catch on that something's wrong. They, they catch on that something's going on. And if you don't tell them, <laughs> they might just make it up. The, the little, the little brains will try and come to some sort of a conclusion, form a little hypothesis or a theory or something to, uh, try and explain what they're observing or experiencing. And, you know, kids are switched on, but they're not that smart. So they may come up with pretty, pretty inaccurate, pretty wild, uh, conclusions that are not true but we'll follow them around for potentially the rest of their life unless they get checked uh, and and challenged about those uh, those beliefs and uh, assumptions. So, you know, talking to, to a kid about why something happened and how it happened and, and what this means is really important because they will be affected by it regardless. So um, getting in front of it and talking to them about it in a a healthy way and telling them what the actual deal is rather than letting their little kid brain spin stories about it, uh, is actually really important. Um, you, you see it a lot with, you know, abuse and trauma and things like that, where the kid will, will sort of rationalize it and explain it and often blame themselves for it because they don't have the proper information about what is actually going on and why. 
So yeah, it's, um, it's, it's good to talk to kids about loss and grief and trauma and pain and death and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and they're going to want to know about it. The probably the more you don't talk about it, the more they're going to want to know about it. So you actually can sort of get in front of it and take away its power and, and just sort of normalize it and make it this thing. And then the kid's like, Oh, okay. Um, and it doesn't have to impact them. It doesn't have to dominate their life, but ironically, it probably will. Uh, if you don't talk about it, if you, if you try and keep it a secret and put on a brave face and not acknowledge it or whatever, um, it, it will probably impact them a lot more. So, um, that's, that's a lot of talk about death and loss and trauma and, um, some pretty heavy stuff and getting towards the end of my picture. I am admittedly kind of regretting how detailed this picture is because my hands getting a little bit sore. Um, it's very pretty though. I'm liking the picture, but it is quite detailed and I haven't actually done, I'd say there's, there's probably like a third of it to go. (laughs) So I might, I might take a break and maybe I'll resume this on another day or I'll just sort of keep coloring this in, but like I'll do a, a different audio for it or something. Um, because I'm aware that I've been talking for a long time and, um, I think it's, it's an important topic but it, it, it certainly can be a difficult topic and I'm aware of that. And you may need to do some self care. Um, you probably will. You may need to do a little bit of journaling and reflect upon some things that you may have learned that there's some ideas that may be challenging or confronting for you. Some things that you may disagree with that may bring up some pretty powerful feelings for you. That's okay. Um, but I I think it's, it's important to be able to acknowledge this stuff and to be able to talk about it and to be able to think about it. And it can be difficult, but it's really worthwhile doing it. And I'm proud of you for doing it. (laughs) I'm proud of me for doing this lovely picture. (laughs) Okay, my little rain clouds. Until next time. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.